All right, everybody, welcome to the 335th edition of the Holy Backboard Podcast. I am Dustin here in Rip City, and I got my man Sage here live and direct. And we're here to talk about our first mock draft of the draft cycle, and this is this is pretty exciting. This is probably like my favorite type of content to record. I look forward to this. We were planning on releasing a future Friday, and we both hadn't done the quality of research up to our standards. And yeah. it was just like, wait, wait, the March Madness is over. UConn has won the, the Natty. The draft lottery is like a month away. Where? What are we doing here? Like, let's do mock draft 1.0. And if anybody who knows me knows I love the draft and I love mock drafts more than I probably should every morning, I'll Google 2023 NBA mock drafts. I I don't care who it is. I want to read who they have the Blazers taking, uh, who they have like going high, who they have going too low, who's their riser, who's their faller. Uh, I love mock drafts that don't follow group think. And I think we did a really good job of that last year. I think we did three or four mock drafts. I think yeah, we, did we did a really good job of not going by the the mold. Like we have our own philosophies um, for this. I think exercise is the right word to use for this first mock. We will use the unofficial order that is just based solely on record. And then once the, the lottery happens, then we will actually go down and uh, see you know, obviously who moves up, who moves down in the draft, and that that will change things quite a bit. But for now, we'll just use the standard one through 14, which can be found on any any website, but we'll use Tankathon for this. I will take, <clears throat> I'll take the odds. Sage, you're going to take the evens. That mm-hmm. gives me Portland at, at number five, but it's, it's just such a fun, fun thing to do. And you can, the mock draft is interesting because you can look at it a multitude of ways you can say this is what i think the teams will do or this is what i would do for the teams and so at least when i put together these mocks for for holy backboard it's a little bit a combination of both because there's really like if you think they should take a prospect who's maybe the 30th ranked prospect in in the lottery that's not really realistic either but if you're just going by what you think they're going to do without putting any of your insider opinion onto it then you're not really providing the listener with or the reader in Mm -hmm. this case with with much value so it's definitely a combination for me of what i think they should do what i think they will do factor in team needs as well and you know tiebreaker i think always goes to best player available right you know blazer fans should know all about taking the the best player available because we've been burned in the past by drafting for need rather than by talent so without further ado uh do you have anything you would like to add before we just dive right in let's get into it all right you know i think these first two picks will will go pretty quick because i mean these first two picks have been set in stone i think for probably the past like two years um, so in in this mock, like Detroit with a 17 and 65 record, uh, they will land the number one overall pick. And I think it's a no brainer that they take uh, Victor Wimbanyama, the seven five, you know, Frenchman who really is positionless. You, you could put him nearly in any position. Uh, I think I was talking about him with, with Olga the other day about just the gravity of his of his height. And, and I was looking back through. Probably since like 1979, I think when you can go back to Magic and Larry about the draft and the the hoopla surrounding it. And I was just kind of going through the years and I was trying to quantify the the hype surrounding Victor Wembanyama and some of the prospects that came to my mind, whether, you know, being alive during that time or just, you know, reading and and hearing about uh, just the the hoopla surrounding certain prospects. And I think there's a list of less than 10. Obviously, you go Magic. Uh. Hakeem was the guy in 84. It, it wasn't Jordan. Um, you had Shaq. You had Tim Duncan. You had LeBron James, uh, Greg Oden. And that's that's really the the end of, of the... And then now you have Victor Wembanyama. So he's arguably... Not arguably. He is the most high prospect since Greg Oden in 07. And I think if you put him up on that list, he might be the most hyped prospect of all time. And it's when you watch him, 
it's completely warranted because I was watching a scouting report on him. And the thing that stood out to me the most, and I, I once I heard it, it was almost like, you know, the light bulb went off in your head. He's a seven foot player who doesn't look like a seven foot player. Like when you think of these tall players, whether it's a Yao Ming or a Sean Bradley, they're kind of a little gangly in, in mm. their, their, their gates, a little mm-hmm. awkward and they don't run super smooth. Victor Wembanyama looks as smooth out there as almost like a guy like Shaden Sharp last year. Like the, the gate looks fantastic. He looks like he's a six, seven player, but just in a seven, five body. Like it looks so natural. He's got handle. He's got uh shot selection and diversity. He's cut playmaking ability. He's a, a, a God tier defender. Like when, when I say the Blazers best chance at winning a title with Dame, is drafting Victor Wembanyama. Mm. This is why, because he is a franchise changer, and I really think he's going to do what Wilt Chamberlain did in his era. Like there may be rules where they have to stop him a little bit, like what they had to do with Wilt, like to negate his rules. dominance. Yeah, because he's if he stays healthy, I don't even think it's a, a question of whether he hits. Like you watch him, you see the skill. Like it, it's off the charts. If he just stays healthy, you're looking at a potential goat. And I don't throw that out there lightly. Like this is how good he is. He could literally break the NBA. Whoever gets him, if he stays healthy, start printing those banners because he, Cade, Ivy. I mean, what the beauty with the fit in Detroit is they have Jalen Duran who can play that traditional five, and you can play Victor at a three four on mm. on the on the post on the wing. You know, just move him all around the floor. He's he's limitless. So this is the pick. He would, I mean, revitalize the a Pistons team that just hasn't really had anything going for them since that title in 04. You know, like I, I think it's 50, 50th percentiles for Chris Stapps, right? Yeah. So maybe it, that's his floor, to be honest. Like Chris Stapps is quite quite good. So the fact that he his his lo- most likely low outcome is that is pretty phenomenal. So, with the the second pick, the Houston Rockets run to the uh, run to the podium and get Scoot Henderson. If if Victor wasn't in this draft class, we would be gushing over Scoot Henderson, and it feels like he's just being underrated because of because of Victor. Because I think he he's the best prospect point guard since Derrick Rose. And honestly, when I watch him against grown men instead of CUSA talent when Derrick was playing, I see so much potential in, in in everything he does offensively. And then he has great effort defensively and is a good defender. I remember watching Derrick Rose and he only got up for DJ Augustine. He wasn't really caring about, you know, going against Tulane or whatever, but like, I, I think Scoot Henderson as a point guard prospect is is super close to can't miss, and I think he fits the team. They get to get off the Kevin Porter uh, deal. Jalen Green is a really good off ball player. His off ball movement's great. He's a great cutter. So Scoot's going to be able to set him up. They got Jabari. They got uh, Alperin Sangoon. They got Ari off the bench. This team is starting to get a lot of top tier talent, and even some of those talents that a lot of teams with love are about to get traded for nothing because they got a lot of young picks going back. But I think Scoot Henderson is going to be the the alpha of the team. I know Jalen Green was picked just as high, but I, I I believe in Scoot Henderson's potential and what he can do for an NBA team. And being a pure point guard is something that is so rare. And then I, I think that all of their, they have a, like a diversity of positions and players. So whoever their future head coach is can just throw a lot of different things at opponents. Yeah, that's a fantastic pick. And I think aside from getting uh, Wembenyama, Houston is the team that is in most dire need of a floor general. They need an alpha. That team is a mess. They are in complete disarray. When you like the team with that much young talent shouldn't be so poor all, all the time. Like they're, they just, they don't know how to play basketball they they lack direction. That backcourt is horrible. I mean, that's why when Jabari got drafted, you know, we were mocking Paulo there for the longest time. It's like mm-hmm. it's just a terrible fit because those two guards want to do nothing but shoot the basketball. They need someone in there who's going to actually 
uh, run an offense. And mm-hmm. so I, I like that you mentioned that he's going to be the alpha because I, I completely see that as well. And just let's chill on the three point percentage because look at a guy like De'Aaron Fox, what he's doing against the Warriors. He wasn't no- noted as a three point shooter coming out of Kentucky. Players can get better. I feel like shooting does. is the easiest thing to get better. And it's not like the it. shots broke. Mm-mm. I mean, he he's does so hit, many other. He's going to hit pull up twos consistently. I believe in that. So and let's can... not look at the, the statistics and be like, oh, well, he started to fall off. Like I made that mistake with Luka Doncic. It's like he kind of fell off in, you know, uh, I think he played with Bar- Barcelona. And you start thinking, oh, is he, is he really that good? Like he kind of struggled towards the end of the year. Well, he's playing grown man basketball for a longer than a, co- a collegiate season. Mm-hmm. Like you have to give these players, you know, some some leeway. And uh, I think that's the same thing with Henderson, who's been playing against adults for mm-hmm. the past two years since he was, you know, 17. So no yeah. brainer pick here. And I think the third pick of the draft that is where uh, it gets interesting with the, the San Antonio Spurs. So if the Spurs keep the, the third pick, this is really where the draft kind of gets turned uh, up upside down because it could, it could be a plethora of, of players. And I think they are going to go with uh, a men Thompson and there, there's an argument there for, for Brandon Miller, but when you factor in that they drafted Josh Primo and it's, it is a coincidence that he played for University of Alabama as well, but he had the the off court incident, which forced them to waive a player who was a lottery pick a year into his lottery deal, and nobody has picked him up. The Spurs don't want to become that franchise that has a reputation for taking a player with with whatever could be deemed as as character concerns. Whether Brandon Miller is is charged or or not, he's always going to have that looming over his head that he was involved in a, a shooting that took someone's life and i don't think that organization wants to just have that and i also think it's probably the perfect organization yeah. to take a chance on a man thompson who is a player with maybe the most upside aside from Wembenyama. you look at the frame he's got a wing frame at, at six seven but playmaking great passing he is the one that can now set the table. Like they, they do have Trey Jones, but they moved DeJounte Murray for the, the slew of picks from Atlanta. Now they need someone who can get, you know, the Devin Vassells, the Kelton Johnsons of the world uh, involved. Uh, they took guards last year, Blake Wesley, Malachi Branham. They really need that ultra athletic wing player to kind of build everything around. And if there's one organization that you can trust to develop a player, mm-hmm. you know, Kawhi Leonard wasn't Kawhi Leonard when he was drafted out of San Diego State. Like he was late lottery. Uh, I think he went 15th actually, and they swapped George Hill for him yep. from the Indiana Pacers. And they turned, they helped develop Kawhi into a monster. Like this is the organization that can get it done. The shot, I have a huge concern over the shot. Um, it terrifies me if Portland were to draft a player like Amen because it's it's not even the percentages, it's the form. It, it looks Michael Kidd Gilchrist bad, and that never worked out. And he was never more than just an average role player. But when you're in the top three, and it's I don't know if there's a clear cut third best player in this draft, a team like San Antonio, small market, they feel like they've rolled the dice before on developing players. I think they do it again with Amen, and they like. They are a team that has good self-awareness. They know they're not going anywhere anytime soon. They're trying to build this organically. They can afford to invest three to four years into him. And by the time he's ready to roll, maybe they've got a few other rookies uh, alongside of him. And, and they're ready They're ready to, to do their thing. Uh, so I think it makes the most sense for them to go with the, that Thompson twin. I think you put him on ball because that's where he is best at. You don't want him spotting up. And it, it, Trey Jones can go to be a backup point guard or you can trade him for another you know, asset, but I put him on ball instantly. He's just going to be a six, 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 seven point guard. But like, you don't, you don't take the, the passing and creation ability away from someone that, that potentially special. And um, when I was looking at it, I was like, yeah, I would take a men three, even though he isn't three on my personal board, he is definitely three for that specific team. And the ceiling is immensely high for him to potentially, just blossom into something that, you know, might keep pop on the team for longer. And, you know, it's going to be great for Devin Vassell. He had to do a lot of creation and Keldon also had to do a lot of creation. Now that they can go back to their role, 
go down a bit in responsibilities and just be able to to shoot and score or with Keldon drive and score. Yes, the Charlotte Hornets are with the fourth are going with a sword Thompson. Um, they definitely have the the bigs that you know deserve the time. So Jarris would be wasted, but a sword gives them potential secondary creation. I think uh, Lamella will always be that number one guy for the Charlotte Hornets, but a sword can be that secondary attack off of like that secondary action. His handle and Lamelo's has the potential to be a very scary combination. A sore in the playoffs shot eight attempts per game from three and shot like 36, 37 percent from three. So his 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 shot form and the results are a lot better than his brothers. And I, I think that he really can be an all world defensive player. And with the Hornets being such a fast team, which will help a sore, but being a really bad team, I think he'll be able to shine offensively and defensively with his athletics, his athleticism and his his drive and the way he just he's a dog defensively. So he it's going to be a very nice pairing. So the the Thompson's twins go three and four in our mock. And at five, the the you have a lot of options are are on the clock. There are a lot of options, you know, uh, in its positions of need, I think, which is the best outcome. If you're you're a Blazer fan and you're looking at the selection, you've got, you know, Taylor Hendricks from Central Florida, Cam Whitmore from Villanova, Jarris Walker from Houston. Uh, those would probably be, I think, the top three selections right now with both of the, the twins off of the board. And my gut says Taylor Hendricks is going to be the better player. Oh, but we're not we're not projecting trades right okay. now. And so if I did want Taylor, I would probably look at a team who wants to move up into the top five, maybe t- gamble on Cam Whitmore or someone like that. But for the sake of this and just knowing how desperate of a need it is for Portland, I go with the second best defender in, in this draft in Jarris Walker from Houston. Yeah. He moves well for such a big body person. Like you look at him, he looks like a defensive end. And I do think he might need to slim down a bit just because that, you know, we've seen players like Zion, right? And I know he's not Zion, but Zion is a a thick, thick human being. And it's hard to run and jump and take all of that wear and tear on, on your limbs and And land. Let's, and land yes he's not the (laughs) athlete of zion clearly yeah but what sells me on jarris is the fact that you're getting a secondary playmaker like the defense is obviously the first selling point but the second one in offense he's not going to be a 20 point per game scorer i I think you're looking at a player and i I kind of looked at like he's like a modern day buck williams he's going to come in he's going to rebound the basketball He's going to play on and off ball defense at an elite level. Like he projects to be, I think, a first or second all, all defensive team. But he's also going to have that playmaking ability. So if, if you double him, he's going to kick out of double teams. You put him in the middle of the floor in the quote unquote Draymond Green role. role. He's going to hit the, the cutter, the open shooter. Uh, and this is, I think, the next step in Portland rebuilding in the Shaden Sharp era. You've got your alpha in Shaden. Now you need to start to shore up the, the defense, uh, especially at the three and the four. And you need another playmaker. Like Shaden's growing into that playmaker role, but you need an additional playmaker who's not going to take a ton of usage away from your, your primary offensive weapon. Uh, mm. So I, I I love the fit here. Uh, I think he still has a plenty of upside. And especially when you're watching players in college, like he was doing this for the number one ranked team for the majority of the year as, as a freshman. And usually when players who have uh, a good skill set transition from the the collegiate ranks to the pros, the game just opens up so much more. There's so much spacing. There's so he's not going to have like the eyes of the defense on him at at all times. Like he's going to be able to really go in there and find find the spaces, like especially if you've got Dame and Shaden there you're going to have a lot of gravity in that backcourt and he's going to be able to make a lot of decisions and have a lot of responsibilities uh, year one. So I, I really like that fit. And if you're not getting Wimbenyama or Henderson, I, I think a player like Walker is exactly what Portland should need. Like, I don't know if he projects as an all-star, 
But if you can project someone as a first or second all defense, that's that's the, the basis of a good foundation for your team. Like there are other avenues to get all stars. If you can get defense, which you've consistently ranked in the bottom five mm-hmm. for half a decade, you, you need to start shoring up that area. Uh, so it's a no brainer for me. He's he's so scheme versatile with defense, too. Like, I think you can put him on any in any real scheme and he's just going to be able to anticipate what happens for for the the Blazers defensively. So that shores up a lot. And then, like, I, if he if he com- becomes the modern day Paul Millsap, that's great for the team. He he'll ma- he'll get a few All Stars. He'll play some amazing defense. Be the linchpin of a lot of stuff that we're doing defensively. I mean, it it it, it is a great pick. I really it, like. I thought I was. I thought I had Indiana next, but we have Orlando. So I was. I, I would have if you didn't take them there. I would have. But with the Orlando Magic, and this is a tough one because, you know, I I feel like t- with what's left, Taylor Hendricks is the best player. But they have so many guys that kind of are like that. They have Paulo, who's going to need 35 minutes they have Wendell Carter they have Franz Wagner I feel like they this is the team that would like to trade down the most if Jarris is gone well even if Jarris is gone and it's it's tough for them because they already have a second lottery pick so I think they may move up to nab the the player that they want yeah well they definitely they definitely have options but it's just like since amends off the board I can't get them and it's like the Markel Fultz can handle the point guard role in another year. So it, it, it puts them at a weird position. So I'm feeling like it's it's a very tough uh, spot to be in where it's like, am I getting Grady Dick? Am I getting Nick Smith, Kaysen Wallace, one of those guys? So it, I think I'm going, and I know you don't find this guy to be as valuable as i do and we haven't done a future friday on him yet but i really believe in nick smith as like a secondary creator and score and right now i feel like they need some offense on the on the team because france is i mean paulo is really the only alpha scorer so to have a secondary guy like nick smith who you know his his archetype is very there's a lot of guys like him, a six four six five guard that can score. There's a lot of guys like him, but I see a lot of successes in the like. He isn't the best with pressure, but I I remember seeing Tyrese Maxey struggle with that. I saw I, Devin Booker struggle with that. If he can get past that initial uh, difficulty handling that defensive pressure and then just can go straight line and go, I see a lot of value for it. So I'm going Nick Smith here. And, you know, Paulo's going to be number one, but having that weak side Nick Smith to either shoot or drive or put his man in some sort of pressure is going to be a good move. I really don't think the arrogance on Nick Smith is what we saw. When I watched some college games, I was amazed at his athleticism and his burst, especially to the hole. So if he can develop those moves to get the NBA defender to go one side and he go the other and score... It's a very I, I am picking early, but I think that where the magic are, it's kind of the best uh best left option for them. I know you don't like it. That is super high for Nick Smith, but again, we, we don't go by groupthink over here. So I would I wouldn't be shocked if Nick Smith goes six, but hey, it's it's I have him field. I have him eight currently on my on my okay. mock. So Moving up a little, but I really uh, like you can't really take a you can't really pay attention to that Arkansas tape because there were so many bad factors, especially the injuries. So if he can get his knee right, he's a fantastic off ball scorer and can be that second side playmaker for the Orlando Magic. At number seven, the Pacers are on the clock, and I think this is another no brainer. They take Taylor Hendricks yeah. from uh, Central Florida. Pair him with Miles Turner, just a significant upgrade in their uh, interior uh, defense. They don't need a floor general. They've got Tyrese Halliburton. Mm-hmm. They don't need wing scorers. They've got Benedict Matherin. They've got Buddy Heald. They also have another floor general and Andrew Nimhard. 
So Hendricks is the best available player on the board right now. He doesn't need the ball in his hands. I think that's what gives him the nod over a guy like Cam Whitmore. He's just a better defender. He's just going to do all of the little things. Uh, high riser. I think he might go higher than seven. Um, yeah, e- easy pick here for me. T- Taylor Hendricks, Central Florida. I would have. Uh, so for every pick that you've done, I would have done the same thing. You know, this team has done so poorly at getting and using first p- round picks for their advantage. And it's really between Brandon Miller and Cam Whitmore. I believe in Brandon Miller more than Cam. And uh, um, so the main things with Brandon Miller that I didn't like watching him at Alabama was I felt like he, in the beginning of the year, he took too many difficult shots. He really slowed that down in the, the, uh, later part of the year but i still think that there is an issue with his strength and athleticism i don't think he's going to get that more athletic now and he got bumped off of his spot a lot at bama so those are the two real main things but he is a nutty scorer i don't i don't get the uh the kd comps or the paul george comps because neither of those two had the athletic limitations that brandon does but as a scorer and potential playmaker, if he develops it, I think that is the best possible place for him to uh, for him to be with the uh, Washington Wizards. I didn't. I didn't feel like. I don't. Maybe I should have taken him with Orlando, but I wasn't really thinking straight. But I think if if he lasts to Washington, that is a huge value because a lot of people have him two three. With us, we don't have him as a highly regarded so that that might be a a bias on our part but where he is at with the washington wizards that's a huge value yeah that that's good value that's more in line with where i think he projects is a late later lottery type of player i don't see paul george at all um i think i saw danny granger somewhere it's like yep that that's closer to it um i have questions about the shot at the nba level especially putting the ball right in front of his face it's going to be hard to shoot off of movement, shoot off of the bounce. Yeah, you can catch and shoot, but all the other types of shot creation that you need to be able to get off at, at the league, that that's a tough ask given where he positions that basketball. And he just, when I watched him at Bama, like just kind of looked like Rashard Lewis to, to me. Like he's just chucking threes. Like I know he was that beginning or was that in the beginning of the year? Cause yeah, that, that, that was him. Yeah, I mean, I, I, the end, he, he struggled towards the end of the year too. I mean, he, the Bama did not have a good tournament run. And when, yeah. and when you see who, you know, the final four was, there really wasn't that very many top seeds. So that final four was theirs for the taking. And again, collegiate performance isn't the end all be all, but at the same time, there has to be more to somebody's game than just sitting on the perimeter, especially if I'm taking them in the top five and just sitting on the perimeter and, and hoisting threes. Like I, I don't think he's a superb athlete. I think they're, I just think I, I'm not super high on Brandon Miller. And this is not even taking into consideration the other issues. Yeah. The, the off court issues, which will, which will surround it. This is strictly on the court. Like I, he's just not a guy that I'm super high on. I know everyone else is. It's just that I've got a feeling. So I don't think he lost until eight, but I'm not mad at where you have him slated. You know, can I say one thing about? I don't want like I felt like with Kevin Porter Jr. A lot of people on NBA Twitter and like they it felt like they wanted him to fail. I don't want Brandon Miller to fail. I hope that he is extremely successful as a basketball player. But you have to take in consideration of what happened in the past. But I don't wish any negative on him in his basketball career. And I feel like a lot of people did for Kevin Porter Jr. And that I think that was the last real like potential behavioral issue. I, I I hope that Kevin Porter sorts it out. I hope that Brandon Miller sorts it out. And uh who do you have with the jazz at, uh, no no with the shit. Yeah no, yeah the jazz shit sorry Utah has uh, two picks in the top 16. They also own Minnesota's pick at 16. Obviously, we're not getting to 16 today. It's the lottery. But they have their first pick, number nine. And the Jazz are probably a team that are going to regret winning so many games to kind of 
obviously they could still move up in the in the draft. It's, it's happened before. Chicago did it, I think, in this position to get Derrick Rose. And I think the the Cavaliers did it in 2011 to get Kyrie Irving. So they could move up. I sure hope they don't. You know, no jazz love on on this podcast. But if they stay at nine, I think they take uh, the the best highest upside player. And I think they go Cam Whitmore. I think he fits in really nicely with uh, a Lowry Markkinen and Walker Kessler front line. He's uh, a player who, if he hits, maybe you're looking at a Gen Z version of of Charles Barkley. Uh, even if he even if he doesn't, I, I still think you're going to get a high motor Corliss Williamson type of player who could start for, you know, 10 plus years. I, I don't think there's significant bust potential there, but to get to that uh, immense ceiling would uh, it, it's not a it's not a comfortable number. What would in which I would be comfortable selecting him with the Blazers pick, right? Like, I just think it's a, oh, that's a small, huge difference. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's a pretty small percentage of him hitting his peak. But he's a super fun player. I think he's going to put butts in seats. Uh, it's going to be a jazz team that's already really fun to watch. They're going to get out in transition. You're going to get Kessler probably blocking shots, outlets. Oh, yeah, that's going to be awesome. Outlets to, to Whitmore. And he is just going to run like a bat out of hell. And if he gets off of two feet, you know, you got to watch out. Like, I, I, he's a player early on. His tape looked great at Villanova coming off of that that injury. And then it fell off a bit. But Villanova, this again, when we did a future Friday on, on Cam Whitmore, the first one of, the, of this cycle, this isn't Jay Wright's Villanova Wildcats. Like he's not. Do you there believe anymore. in his passing? Because I, I like Jay Wright would have we would know if he can pass. It's he didn't with this new guy. He has a chance to. Like, I'm not gonna say he just like Amen Thompson, I don't believe in his shooting. I'm not gonna say I don't believe in Cam Whitmore's passing because again, it's a collegiate game. You're not running NBA style mm. offenses. Like there's only so many coaches like Mike Woodson at university of Indiana. He's running some of that. John Howard mm. at Michigan. He's running some of those sets. Bama had great, uh, great for uh, Brandon Miller too. But you know, you're not getting that at a consistently high level um, at the collegiate, at the collegiate game. So it's, it's hard to say, but like, I do like him as a prospect, uh, I, I think if he can just reel in a little bit of that tunnel vision, because at the at, at, at this level, he felt like he could just power over his opponent and he would just go in, head down and, and try to bully ball and end up getting getting it blocked. So as an undersized wing who has a lot of power, he he really needs to refine that and pick and choose his spots. Um, I think what will set him apart is he needs to work on that burst right when he gets the ball and be if he if he can't beat. NBA power forwards off the dribble. That's what's going to hold him back on, on the offensive end. Is he defensively? Gonna... I don't think he's a sieve. Uh, I don't know hmm. if he's going to be all world, but I, I think with his athleticism, he, it, once he, if he puts his mind to it and he learns the off ball game, like he could be a menace in the passing lanes. And then you're looking at someone in transition that you just want to get out of the way. Like that's where I think he can thrive. I think he has the ability to be a really good rebounder. Uh, just throwing his body around, like finding the the angles. Um, again, at nine, I love this this oh, yeah, yeah, spot. Yeah. For I would take Cam Whitmore around this spot. Like I feel comfortable here. So is he the three? Because it's Walker, yes. Kessler, yes. and Lowry. So, I mean, he's gonna have the spacing. The only person he has to contend with really is Walker Kessler around the basket. I, one of the the things that I noticed with him was he he gets to the spot. He gets to his spot. And then he can't finish well. So I think he was overextended at Villanova. So if he can handle being scaled back a bit and be able to use his athleticism, then sure. I I think that this is a great spot for him to be at. It's going to be entertaining to see him just, you know, one man, one man army in transition. So I, I think it's a very good pick for the Utah jazz at, at 10. I mean, in this scenario, do they have Kyrie or not? Because <laughs> I they think... do, but I, I mean, I, Dallas is 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 not going to keep this pick. Let's let's be perfectly clear. Like they are using this to try to get help around Luka Doncic right now. Yeah. Like they are in DefCon five right now in Dallas. They they have to do whatever it takes because Luka is like, I'm gonna bounce, yeah. and you have to assume they didn't just throw the season to take a a. A great 18, 19, 20 year old prospect that's at this point in the draft probably isn't going to impact them in the standings next year. So 
for this exercise, yes, Dallas has Kyrie and Luca, but I think this could be a plethora of teams moving up and, and taking a player here for that. Yeah, definitely. And I feel like they got to go shooter. So it's Grady Dick, it's Jet, it's Jordan Hawkins. I think Jet, if you take him, his his potential playmaking is gone because Kyrie and Luca have like a 60% usage rate. So he's not getting any playmaking. So it'd be a waste for him to go. So it's between Grady Dick and Jordan Hawkins. And I think that Jordan Hawkins with his run to the, the championship has a, his name rings more bells than Grady Dick. Cause he lost to Arkansas in the, in the round of 32. So I, I think that they're going to, if they keep the pick, Jordan Hawkins is going to be a really nice option for Luca as he bully balls his way to the hoop, sees him in the corner. I think that Jordan Hawkins is probably the best movement shooter in this draft. So I could see Luca finding him a lot for open jumpers. And I, I mean, he's his frame is pretty frail right now. So if he puts on that weight, that's going to be awesome. But the way that he just ran around and had so much cardio to find that open spot for him to to, to score, him and Andre, I, I I think they go with uh Jordan Hawkins at ten. What do you think? What do you think about that pick? I would slot them to take Grady Dick just because of the size. Yeah, totally. Um, that's. I mean, I think the archetype is right. I like Hawkins better as a prospect for that specific team. I I think you might get. I mean, Grady Dick's not a good defender either. But again, I don't think. I think Dallas Jordan could be this pick. better as a yeah. Defender. So it he's just shorter. The, he's yeah. It's a tough tough thing to do for this exercise because again, I don't believe Dallas is going to um, be drafting here. But yeah, I love Hawkins. He's he's in my probably top ten. Um, I like players who prove it in college, and those are transit uh, translatable skills. Uh, with what he's doing, uh, scoring in every possible way. Like you're. Do you think Jordan's a better movement getter. shooter than Grady? I think yeah. Grady needs longer to load. Like his, no, his Jordan legs Hawkins is the best more. movement shooter in yeah. the draft. There's so I, no I think that that's it. what Dallas covets with with their shooters. So I, don't, I mean, you know, in a month that they are not going to be here for us to talk about. <laughs> Uh, Orlando was back on the clock at 11, took Nick Smith, um, still uh, early in this, in the, in this, in this uh, scenario at six. So there's still quite a few players left on the board and it's tough because Orlando just is kind of playing a new age style of positionless basketball. Mm -hmm. And there's a player that, that I think they would really covet and this is a player who i think is severely underrated in all of these mock drafts and who's going to rise and i wanted to take them with toronto's pick but it makes too much sense for me at 11 it's rayan Rupert. oh uh, wow okay frenchman plays for the new zealand breakers obviously the new zealand breakers familiar name lamilla ball played there uzman jang uh played there as well uh, this kid is 6'6". Six, six. I think he's going to give them everything they had in the healthy John Isaac, but just the, in a 6'6 six, six body. He can go out there, play defense, doesn't need the ball in his hands, and is smooth as hell. Like, he's just scraping the surface. They, they like San Antonio, they aren't on any timeline to rush to win now. They're taking their time. They finally sorted through that mediocre keep that they had when they had Aaron Gordon and Vucevic and Mo Bamba and they kept drafting the same freaking player mm -hmm. time and time again they they know what they want to do they, they they've got their core they already have some pretty solid backcourt defenders now they add one that could play on the wing and I, I think that should, he's going to go in the lottery I know I see him all the time in the 18s and the 20s mm -hmm. he's going to move up Teams value this type of player. If if your if your scouting department is worth their weight in salt, you will say, look at what the cost of, that teams are willing to pay for OG Ananobi and Mikhail Bridges, right? They, they're both taken in 2017 and 2018. This is a player in that mold. If you're willing to just wait and be patient, use the avenue and the assets that you have now and go after that player. And if you hit, you have him. 
I mean, you have two lottery picks, Sage. Mm -hmm. I, I think they really need to go out there and find players that, that fit their system. And the beautiful thing is, I think six six wings who are known as menaces on the perimeter defensively fit anybody's system, especially Orlando's where he doesn't need the ball. There's not going to be a lot of pressure on him to go out there and and get a high usage. Like this is what they've been missing with John Isaac on the mend uh, pretty much since 2020, mm -hmm. right? That they, they need that all world positional. Uh, yeah, they used Gary defender. Harris to do that last year. Yeah, and, and they've really struggled at, at identifying those those wings. Like they've had Terrence Ross for a long time. They Gary Harris. They traded for RJ Hampton and then cut RJ Hampton. Like it's time for them to kind of lock that down. That like they they think they found it with you know Markel Fultz and Jalen Suggs, maybe Cole Anthony. Like I think one of, I think one of those three is the odd man out there. But but they need a bigger wing, and I, I like that fit there in Orlando. So. This is Oklahoma City at at 12. For me, when I watch OKC, the, the thing that I notice the most is they they lack shooting. Isaiah Joe's their only real shooter that's a guard. And they they put a lot of stress on him whenever he's in to be that stretch guy. Like Josh Giddy isn't the best shooter yet. Dort can get hot. Shea does his best as a rim runner trying to get fouls and layups. So it's between Jet and Grady Dick. And I, I think that they don't need Jet's playmaking. So I, I think Grady Dick is the guy. He has to – I don't think he's a sieve defensively. I think he's fine. If he can buy in and go from fine to better than that, I think that it's it it he's worth his weight in gold with this three point shooting. Could because couldn't you imagine Shea driving and he has this Grady Dick on one side, Isaiah Joe on another. The spacing is going to be so good for those guards that do their best probing in the middle. So I'm trying to make it easier for Shea and Josh Giddy to be the 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 superstars that they can be. So I'm going Grady Dick. And expecting him to buy into their defensive, uh, their defense, so he can be a little bit better than we saw at Kansas. Like I, I think that people, people were a little too. He wasn't good in the first part of the year defensively. He got better, and people judge him for that first part of the year instead of the whole, the whole uh, year of defense. So I, I think that. He, He's pretty damn good value going to Oklahoma City at this late in the lottery. So, yeah, anybody takes anybody that OKC takes is going to be a luxury, right? Yeah. Like they they've got that that thing humming with with Shea, Giddy, Chet's coming back. They've still got Usman Jang, who's their kind of their 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 project, project. that, mm -hmm. that they're developing. Jalen Williams hit the other. Jalen Williams is a, a really a nice re reserve rotational big who can come in and play solid to excellent defense. Like. Spot and center. they have assets for for days, so mm -hmm. they have everything moving in the right direction. Uh, the last pick that I will be making is for the Toronto Raptors. Again, another difficult team to project. Like, there's a lot of uncertainty with Fred Van Vliet. They kind of got into uh, a roster that's unbalanced. Like, they just have the same type of player, whether it's Scotty Barnes, Pascal Siakam, or OG Ananobi. Like. It's not really fitting. They traded their 2024 pick to get Jakob Pertle back. They still have Chris Boucher. They they need it. Precious it's weird. Be, yeah, it's weird because they have a fun roster when you just break it down individually, but collectively, it just it didn't mesh together. They're they're missing something there in Toronto. So it's another team which they may not be picking here. They may trade it out to get some some help, or they may be trading one of those players we discussed and getting mm -hmm. another pick mm -hmm. and then. Who, who knows? But for, again, just for this, the sake of them having 13th overall pick, um, obviously there are a couple of, of guards and, and I'm assuming Van Vliet's not going to be returning um, or not in their, their future plans. Obviously there's Anthony Black, there's Keontae yes. George, uh, and there's Jalen Hood Shafino. Like they, they, there, there are guards out there and Case and Wallace. Yeah, like who, I think Case is the best defender. Well, him and who him I and think, Ann. you know, I think Case and Wallace probably goes a little bit higher and we we may not even have him in, in our lottery because mm -hmm. you look at what 
he he needs he's probably the biggest Davion Mitchell fan right now mm. because Davion is having such a good series so far in Sacramento defending Steph Curry teams are going to see the value in having a significantly uh just fantastic perimeter defender and Casey Wallace is the best perimeter defender uh at the point guard position I mean just he's he's a nightmare um offensively he lacks some I think mm, you know, well, just wow well, don't factor. you want Scotty to to run more of the offense anyway? Sure, but I mean, just I don't know what you're going to get from Case and like. So what what would I have Toronto taking? I have them taking uh, a jumbo combo guard Jalen Hood Shafino from Indiana to to run that run that offense. I think he can play on and off ball. Again, Toronto loves length. They love size, especially at each position. And at six six, he, he's going to be you know top ninety ninth percentile size at the position so again i think another player who's going to rise as as the draft prospect process goes on you see that in the nfl draft all, all the time like anthony richardson really wasn't considered top five like, it's like oh maybe he might go first round mm. might sneak in okay now he's top 10 and now you've got people saying he might go number three and that's just because they're ooing and eyeing at the measurables and the, the 40 time and the arm strength and you know once players get into the workouts you see them in in in, in your team's clothes see the size, the length. You're like, I can envision this. This is this is the type of player we want. So I have them taking Hood Shafino, a guard I really like uh, from Indiana and I think would would make them um, build them another another piece to their already solid foundation. I mean, Toronto is just about versatility and size with their with their players. So, you know, if, if Fred Van Elite goes or stays, it doesn't, it, I mean, it matters, but having him be a taller defender i think it's going to be a good thing and so with the, with the 14th pick in this mock draft yeah. all right there there's two guys that i like anthony black <laughs> on tango you got to say the team name sage not oh, the one's pelican <laughs> sorry I, you know cuz i'm looking at it so i don't feel like i need to say it but yes the new orleans pelican Anthony Black is so similar to Dyson Daniels, so I feel like that would be a misuse of assets for him. I I still feel like they need spacing. You know, CJ and Trey Murphy are really the and, and Brandon can do the mid range stuff, and but he doesn't really shoot threes as much as I would like. And then of course, if you have Zion on the court, you need spacing. I'm going Jet Howard because of the three point versatility, and if. I feel like the only real legitimate ball handlers are CJ and Dyson, but CJ is getting older. He doesn't try as hard in the regular season. He wants to set everybody up and he's always had some sort of injury issue with his time in the Blazers. And so he gets a little bit playmaking reps, but we're having him in the, in the uh, three point, just shooting. So, you know, Brandon can get where he wants easier. CJ can get where he wants easier. Zion can get where he wants easier. So I, I I had to get a shooter. Jet is the best shooter on the board so far. So we're t- the the Pelicans are taking Jet and uh, making everybody's lives easier with his spacing and shooting. W- would you have taken Jet here? Given what's left on the board, yeah, I think yeah. that's a solid pick. Really solid pick. I think he's another player who's probably gonna rise up like he had a little bit of a rough stretch um this season but again you look at the look at the, the pedigree so, yeah you look at the size you look at the stroke then you look at the the upside as a playmaker and if your roster permits giving a player like that that those repetitions to mm-hmm. en- enhance that that skill set you could be looking back and being like this was a top five top seven player from the draft why did he slip all the way down to you know the end of the lottery the the, mm-hmm. the teens um it's always funny looking back and be like, oh, like what player really fell in our, our mock draft? I think the Anthony Black is just Anthony, the one we, yeah. we we couldn't find. Um, you need to Anthony have Black and Case, Case and Wallace. Case yeah. and Wallace and Anthony Black were the two that fell. But again, like I'm not going to, our, our mock draft is not going to look like Tankathon. It's not going to look like any other, the ringer. Like it's, it's, it's ours. Do I think Brandon Miller goes eight? No. Do I, I think, think Anthony six, Black? Probably. Do I think Anthony Black falls out of the lottery? Probably not. Do I think he's a lottery pick? I don't think so. I know you do. But it's just it's 
It's fine. Every it's team fun. needed a shooter. Way. Every team, like Oklahoma City, is not taking Anthony if there is a dead eye three point shooter with what they need to get to that next level. It's it's just like you need to. If, if the Spurs fell, I feel like Anthony Black's pretty perfect. But since the Spurs were at three, they took the better prospect for them. So it, it's tough. Uh, Anthony Black, you need creativity. And I, I think, like, if he goes to the Warriors or something, we're going to be really furious with, you know, not taking him. But some of, some of these teams aren't in a good spot. So they don't have the creativity. They're trying to get the basics. They don't need their – they don't need the – the luxury items when they need to get the basics first, you know what I mean? All right. That was super fun. Uh, We will have Jordan Hawkins up next for our future Friday, but we wanted to get this first 1.0 edition of our mock draft out the door. It'll be a lot more clear. We'll have a lot much more direction. Once the, 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 the ping pong balls sort themselves out in the middle of May. And as soon as the lottery unfolds we will have our mock draft 2.0 uh mm-hmm. coming up there so if there's a prospect that you want to see us discuss hear us discuss that we haven't already you know the draft is coming around the corner probably got two months and maybe a week in change uh let us know in the comments hit us up holy backboard on on twitter or instagram be like you guys need to discuss breakdown xyz be happy to oblige uh sage let our listeners know where they can find us and uh take this one on home We are available everywhere where you get your podcast, like, and five star us. We are on IG doing reels. Now we are on my TikTok doing uh, those videos and we are on YouTube. So if you want to see the entire video podcast, it is there. You get to see Dustin's awesome background dog. Is it hailing where you're at? It is fucking distracting. (laughs) But uh, thank you to so everybody who was listening and watching and looking at all the stuff. We definitely do appreciate it. We do it, you know, to hang out, but we also do it for the listeners, the readers, and the viewers. So thank you so much for inspiring us to to create uh, content. Peace out, everybody, and stay safe, stay healthy, and uh, Bruce. Later, bud. <laughs>